Welcome to Day Trip in Wisconsin. Today we are in Stevens Point, Wisconsin at the Stevens Point University Library, which houses the museum. And we're going to talk to Ray, the director of the museum, so stay tuned. It's a short ride from your neighborhood to your naturehood. To find a neighborhood park or green space near you, visit discovertheforest.org. I'm Dr. Ray Reeser, R-E-S-E-R. Uh, I'm a director of the Museum of Natural History here at UWSP. Um, I've been um, an archaeologist and a geoarchaeologist and currently director of the museum here at UW Stevens Point. Okay. Now, with this being a museum in a pretty historic area, what, what things does the museum here have to offer? So, the, so we're a, a true natural history museum, and so that's a little bit different than like local historical museums. So what we have is sort of, we have uh, dioramas of a lot of the different ecosystems around North America. We also have uh, displays based on items having to do with natural science, having to do with how the world works and what things you find where in the world things having to do with the environment and climate, animals, fish, insects, uh, the fossil record going back to dinosaurs. So basically we're trying to give audiences a glimpse of not only the entire timeline of the earth, but actually the modern world today, the world that surrounds us. Okay. Now since, since we're already here, I know Wisconsin's pretty big in the fishing, so this <laughs> caught my eye right away. So. Sure. So this is, uh, this is a display on native fish and a few marsh birds in central Wisconsin. Uh, here we obviously have some big game fish. Uh, we have muskie and northern pike. Um, in this case, we have more of a mix of river and lake fish. We've got uh, sturgeon, long-nosed gar, which is something you would see in the Mississippi River system. Uh, a lot of uh, local panfish, bass, lake trout from Lake Michigan, and also uh, a series of ducks and waterfowl that you would see in the area. This is a popular exhibit uh, with local folks. We also have a few marine specimens scattered around the museum. Hammerhead shark here, a bull shark is sort of at the entrance of our museum. And uh, this is a recent addition. The, the Ichthyology Club um, installed this um, aquarium behind you. So this is basically a rotating exhibit of native fish and what we do is, is students are doing research on fish and collecting fish in local lakes and waterways. We actually have them collect fish that we rotate in and out of our aquarium here so that people get to see firsthand what live native fish look like. Right. Um, with exhibits like this, is, is this stuff that's, is it donated or who, who collects these specimens? That's a, that's a great question. So a large percentage of what you actually see in the exhibit portion of the museum here, these are donated specimens. Um, and some of them, when we, when we are actually looking for a certain specimen that we might not have, sometimes we kind of put a call out to the community for uh, individual fish species or a bird species or a large mammal species. Now over the years we've pretty much filled up the entire museum so we're not actively looking for more mounts. Um, but another source of our specimens is research that students and faculty do on campus. So within the, the museum proper that we're going to walk through today, we have room for about 700 specimens. Um, and that includes the big mounds all the way down to tiny bird eggs, uh, dinosaur bone. But in our research and teaching collections on campus, we have over 400,000 specimens. 
So we have huge collections on campus and we are only able to exhibit less than 1% of, of those collections at any given time. Yeah, that's quite a bit. I mean, that's, that's a lot of specimens just, I mean, for a whole, I mean, for the small area to house that much specimens. And, and yeah, the museum itself is maybe about, uh, um, I think it's in the neighborhood of 700 or 800 square feet in the exhibit area. We have 20,000 square feet of storage uh, vaults, classrooms, places where we do research on various specimens. So again, it's, it's a big research collection. And that was one of the driving forces when the museum was created in 1968. Okay. Well, we'll be right back. We'll take a short break and we'll continue our tour. So stay tuned. Every day across America, excess food is gathered by a network of good people at local food banks, giving hope to millions of children who struggle with hunger. They've earned their wings, and you can too. Together, we can solve child hunger. Support Feeding America and your local food bank at feedingamerica.org. Welcome back. So, we are in the tundra area here. Can you... Talk a little bit about this. Absolutely. So this is our Arctic Tundra exhibit, basically looking at uh, Alaska and areas in the high Arctic above the tree line. And what this does is it gives people an idea of what that environment is like. It's a fairly harsh environment. Uh, plants that are there are pretty low growing plants and obviously they have to survive really severe winter conditions. And the animals that you see in the case here, we've got musk ox and wolverine uh, Arctic fox, caribou, and wolves. Um, one thing that I like to stress when school groups come through here is every animal that you see in this case, which are common to the Arctic and Alaska today, once existed in Wisconsin. Okay. So right after the glaciers left, these were very common animals in Wisconsin, especially caribou and wolves. Um, so although we don't see muskox in Wisconsin today, we don't see caribou. Uh, all the other species here are are, if uncommon, they're still regular visitors to the state. Um, so again, this, this gives people a little bit of a glimpse of, of what areas quite a bit further to the north would look like. And also kind of a, a brief window into the past of, this, of the state right after the large ice sheets melted north. Okay, now when I see exhibits like this, I mean, what is pretty much like the age of these animal or artifacts that are in here? I mean. Uh, I, so, I, the, so these are actually, they're modern mounts, so, modern so the, mounts. you know, the particular animals that, that were taxidermied and put in this case aren't particularly old. But in terms of, of caribou and muskox, muskox probably have not been common in Wisconsin for 11 to 12,000 years. Oh That's a pretty long time ago. Uh, caribou were probably here quite a bit later, maybe up to uh, five or 6,000 years ago. And as an archaeologist, I can tell you uh, caribou were really the animal of choice. They, they were on the menu frequently for thousands of years in Wisconsin. So this was a very common game animal. Native Americans have been in the state in the neighborhood of 15,000 years. So humans were on the landscape and hunting these animals a very long time ago here in central Wisconsin. Right. And... Um a lot of this, you know, I never would have thought that some of these animals would even be in, in Wisconsin and how diverse Wisconsin used to be, and some of it still is today sure. yet, but so, just the, the wide variety of... Well, Wisconsin really is uh, a rich state, uh, speaking in terms of, of animals and plants, and right here in the center part of the state, in fact, right through the UWSB campus in the center of Stevens Point, we have what's called a transition zone. So we're an area in the state where lots of northern species, bird species, fish species, tree species, plant species, large animal species, from the north extend all the way down to Portage County. The same thing happens, animals that are found in the south extend all the way up to this part of the state. 
So what we have right here in the middle part of the state is this incredible mix and diversity of animals and plants, and it's been like that for thousands of years. So we are really lucky to live in one of the most interesting parts of Wisconsin here. Right. And certainly Portage County is one of the counties in the entire state that has the highest diversity of tree species. And again, it's because we have those northern species and southern species coming here right. in the middle part of the state. Right. So with that, we'll be right back and we'll see a little bit more of the museum. So stay tuned. They said I couldn't dream. Called me a piece of trash and swore that's all I'd ever be. Said a bottle couldn't see the ocean. Give up. Go back to the dumpster. But I didn't listen. I made my way. And now, I am what I've always wanted to be. Okay, welcome back. So, I see that there's a pigeon, but it's not any type of pigeon, because normally when I was in the farm, we, we weren't too fond of pigeons because they would <laughs> right. make a mess. But this is a special kind of pigeon. Tell us a little bit so about it. So this is a special kind of pigeon. So this is a passenger pigeon. And passenger pigeons have now been extinct for over 125 years. And so passenger pigeons are one of those really interesting but complex stories of, of a type of species that was once widespread across the globe and is now extinct. And the passenger pigeon is often held up as, as the, uh, sort of a warning to what humans can do to the environment. Right. We have the dubious honor of having one of the last passenger pigeons shot in the state of Wisconsin. Um, but this is a, a male passenger pigeon. It was recovered in Rock County. Um, and what you see behind you is a recent painting done by a local wildlife artist, Mary Bratz. And what we did is we looked at a nesting site, which was the largest nesting site for passenger pigeons in all of North America. This was a site down in the Rocha Cree area around Babcock, Adams Friendship. And the birds that nested in that area covered 850 square miles. That's how big the colony was of passenger pigeons. It's hard to even get your head around how many billions and billions of these birds there were. But one thing to keep in mind is that was not a sustainable population. That was a population which biologists call an outbreak population. Okay. Basically, the population exploded okay. for some reason and got well beyond the carrying capacity of the environment. And in this case, passenger pigeons were recorded in huge flocks off the east coast, out on the ocean. Sailing captains saw them. I mean, massive flocks uh, on the east coast and the Midwest from Canada all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but in a few short years, they were gone. And a, a lot of that has to do with human predation and hunting, but some of it would have happened naturally. So, so this species was in decline when humans actually reduced their numbers so much that they couldn't recover. And, and again, this is, it's sort of a great object lesson for school kids when they come in because we, we can look at an amazingly beautiful bird um, who were once so numerous that their flocks could fly over for multiple day, days and make the sky literally dark. And, and the noise was deafening. You could not hear yourself talk. <laughs> so it's hard to even imagine flocks of birds that big today. Yeah. Now, when you talk about hunting, were they just hunted just to be killed or to be eaten? Or? They, were, they were eaten, and so um, 
When passenger pigeons were at their peak is also when railroads were really expanding in the Midwest and the East Coast. And hunters would come by train load and they would track where passenger pigeons were nesting. Um, so these birds were shot by the billions and packed in barrels and shipped out to the East Coast, shipped down south to New Orleans, and they were sold for a penny or two per bird. Okay. They were also netted, they were clubbed. Passenger pigeons would often nest so thickly and roost so thickly on given trees that they would break the limbs right off big adult trees. Jeez. So they were, they were dispatched in every manner you can imagine. And they were often even used just for hog feed. Uh, they were so numerous. Um, so they were um, they were used in pigeon pot pies. I mean, there's there's all these all these uses for the bird. And also, there's many place names in Wisconsin in the Midwest tied with passenger pigeons: Pigeon Forks, Pigeon Lake, Pigeon River, Pigeon Creek. Um, as you look around the state, you realize how common that was. Yeah. Now, were these a little bit more special than just your average pigeon today? I mean... They were, they were a very streamlined bird who could fly incredibly fast. Um, so they often would leave their roost in the morning. They might fly two or three hundred miles to feed during a given day. Jeez. Um, and they also had huge crops. They were mainly nut eaters, so they could eat. Um, the, one of their main food sources was uh, acorns, various types of acorns. And in fact, they ate so much of the acorn crop in the Midwest that they actually influenced what type of trees grew, again, from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up to Canada. We're still seeing the effects of passenger pigeons today. The oak forests we see in the Midwest and going north up into Canada, those are directly related to passenger pigeon predation on nuts. Also, there's a, there's a connection with current Lyme's disease because passenger pigeons ate so many white oak acorns and red oak acorns that they suppress the mouse population. And white-footed deer mice are one of the hosts for ticks that carry Lyme disease. So what we're seeing today with this rise of white-footed deer mice and a rise in Lyme's disease can in some ways be tied directly back to the passenger pigeon and what happened after that large species was removed from the ecosystem. Right, and when you talk about that, it's, it's, it, it takes a little bit to, to, to wrap uh, one person's head around the whole idea that one, how simple one thing goes away like this bird here can cause everything to trickle yeah there, there's huge impacts and and again we're just as scientists around the world we're just starting to get a handle on how complex that is and how interconnected things are but uh, but again you know when we have school groups in and we're talking about the vir the environment and how interconnected things are with different species the passenger pigeon is a great teaching tool for mm, that right so since we have a bird, it had to come from somewhere. So stay tuned and we'll talk a bit about that. Take a look under your bed. Find stuff under there. What about jobs? No? Now try your closet. Still no jobs, just more stuff? Well, you really have both. See, stuff is defined as household articles considered as a group. Sometimes this stuff is no longer needed. Wait, no longer needed? I can't be right. Because remember those jobs you were looking for? Those are really needed, and they're the stuff inside your stuff. Our job is to unlock those jobs, and it starts when you donate your stuff to your local Goodwill. Here's how we do it. When you donate to Goodwill, we sell your stuff to provide job training for people right here in your community. So just by teaming up with Goodwill, you help create jobs. And isn't that worth parting with the leftover guitar from your 80s cover band? Goodwill. Donate stuff, create jobs. Well, welcome back. Tell us, Ray, a little bit about this collection. I mean, I, I walked by it briefly and I had to take a double look. There's, there's a lot of eggs here. There's a lot of eggs here. So this is, uh, this is only a portion of 
what's called the August Schoenbeck Egg Collection. So this is a, a collection of eggs that was assembled in the late 1800s up until about 1920 by August Schoenbeck. He was a German immigrant, came to the United States and had a, a really serious interest in birds and their life ways and collecting. And back around the turn of the century, egg collecting was a very big thing. But Schoenbeck, much like John James Audubon, collected more than the eggs. He could, uh, collected the adults of, of all bird species that he could, mounted the adults, he collected the nests if he could find them, and obviously connected, uh, collected the eggs and carefully drilled and removed the yolk from each egg so that the egg wouldn't go bad mm -hmm. over time. Um, so we have a lot of eggs here from species that are now extinct or no longer occur in various areas of the state or the Midwest. And we have everything from ostrich eggs to hummingbird eggs and lots and lots of birds that don't occur in North America. One of the things that August Schoenbeck was adept at was he wrote to sailing ship captains all over the world. And when people would be in remote places, they would collect bird eggs on islands in the Pacific up in the Arctic, down in Antarctic, and they would send those eggs back to August Schoenbeck. So we have an incredible collection here. And one of the interesting things for me as a scientist with these eggs is not only their beauty and the diversity and the, and the coloring on the eggs and the size of the eggs, but also the fact that we can use these for research even today. So each one of these eggs, we can take tiny samples of the shell and we can do what's called oxygen isotope analysis, where we actually analyze uh, minerals and compounds that are in the eggshell that were deposited there because of the water those birds were drinking hundreds of years ago. That leaves a signature that actually allows us to place where these eggs came from, sometimes within 20 or 30 miles of where these birds grew up anywhere on the globe. And that allows us to recreate where these birds once lived, what their range was over time, and that's information we can no longer gather. These birds are gone from the environment. We can't recreate that environment. Right. So in some ways, this is, this is a gold mine for scientists to mine information from natural history collections like this. Right. Now, when you talk about research and other scientists, is there a lot of involvement or um, not involvement um, where scientists would contact like a museum saying hey there's something there that I would like to look at does sure. that happen quite a bit it again it varies by collection so uh, again we have uh, we have very large collections we have 11 main collections uh, within the museum again about 400,000 specimens and some of those we some of those collections we have really active exchange programs where we actually swap specimens with other museums and universities so they might have something that we don't have and we would like to get that. We might have local specimens that they don't have, so we will trade specimens with them. We also have visiting scientists who contact us and they want to come in and look at something that we might have in our collections. And really the advent of the internet and digitizing collections, getting those photographed and online, has really opened up that entire world and it's making research collections like we have here at UWSP available to everybody around the world. Uh, recently I was contacted by uh, scientists in France who were looking at various types of butterflies. I work with people all around the Midwest on fossils and artifacts, stone artifacts. I work in the Southwest. I work up in Ontario, Canada. So there's, there is this vast network of scientists who are really looking at collections all over the United States and we have this we have this real window now where you can look at that stuff online and access it. All right. Now, I mean is there they're still doing research whether it's um, they find something new or they want to retest something that can still happen yet or Absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, um, you know, when you think of sort of the whole Indiana Jones mythology, <laughs> and people, people being out in the desert or, or doing field work, that's still a very active part of science, especially natural science. But now in North America, more new discoveries are made each year in existing museum collections than are made out in the field where people are finding new stuff today. 
And in fact, often when things are found today, there's a backlog. It may be years before that's actually recorded or put on display. And in some cases, it may be a hundred years for things like the Field Museum or the Smithsonian Museum. Really large museums have an even longer backlog. We certainly have things that were collected in the 50s and 60s that have never been on display. Yeah. So talk about things that have never been on display. You, the collection gets rotated? So parts of the collection are permanent, some of the dioramas are permanent, but we also have multiple rotating exhibit cases. And what we do there is we try and highlight things that might really catch the public's interest or things that catch our own interests as scientists. So we put, uh, we try and rotate what um, what is currently being researched here at UWSP. So currently we have fish fossils and plant fossils from what's called the Green River Formation in Colorado and Utah on display. We have Native American artifacts that were covered in Portage, Wood, Washera, and Wapaka County on display. We have Plains Indian artifacts that were collected at the turn of the century out in the Dakotas. Those are currently on display. And then we have sort of one-off displays. We have a display of a black bear named number 50, which was a, a bear that had been tagged and tracked by biologists for many years before it was sadly killed by a car up in Shawano County. Mm -hmm. We have a display about the life of that bear and what happened to it and basically how tough an animal it was and how resilient it was. Mm -hmm. So again, we do try and mix up the displays. Uh, we don't have a huge amount of space here at UWSP for exhibits, and so we, we try to maximize that. Also, once a year, for one day out of the year, we have what we call the collection crawl. And for one morning out of the year, we open up all of the collections areas on campus. So the public can come in and they can look at insects, fish, parasites, paleontology, dinosaur fossils. They can look at archaeology. They can look at mammalogy. Um, they can look at birds. And what we do is we open those collections and we have the curators, the scientists working in those collections, but also all of the students who happen to be working in those collections work on that morning and really talk to the public and people coming in. Really, it's a, it's a way to share these huge research collections with the public. So in a given four hour period, uh, we usually hold it in late March or early April. This year it will be in April. Uh, next year it will be in April again. We usually have 1,000 to 1,400 people come through in four hours. So <laughs> it's a hugely, <laughs> hugely uh, you know, popular event for the public. And we have games for the kids, and you can get a passport and get them stamped at each individual collection you go through. But really, it's a way to, to let the, the state and the community know what we do here at UWSP. Mm -hmm. And these collections don't belong to the university. They belong to the entire state. So we're a state institution. Mm -hmm. and, and I want people to realize that these are your collections. These belong to all of us. And, and the research we do here is to the benefit of everyone in the state. Right. In a little bit here, we'll uh, check out the Native American section. So stay tuned. Everybody has a dream. Mine was to see the ocean. And with a little help, I made it. Welcome back. So Ray, tell us a little bit about this exhibit right here. So Dave, we're standing in front of what's known as the Menominee Clans exhibit. And this is a unique exhibit in North America because it's a 3D depiction of Menominee origin and creation stories. Basically how the Menominee tell the story of where they came from and how they were created. Unlike many other tribes, which have migration stories, basically stories that talk about them traveling from somewhere else to Wisconsin. 
Menominees have an origin story right here in the state. So according to their mythology, the Menominee tribe started when a great light-colored bear emerged from the ground in spring at the mouth of the Menominee River on Green Bay. And this display depicts that entire origin story and the main clans associated with Menominee mythology. So each one of these clan figures is very detailed and meticulously carved and painted to depict not only the animal that that clan represents, but also the tasks that those animals or those clans were responsible for. We have the white-tailed deer up front who pounded wild rice for food. Uh, we have the pine squirrel who was an arrow maker. In the back we have the loon who made dugout canoes. We have the river otter who is a storyteller. Um, so each one of these animals had very specific duties in the tribe. And these were called, uh, carved by Menominee elder and artist James Frechette Jr. You'll notice that we're missing some of the figures uh, from the 30 principal clans of the Menominee Nation. That's because Jim Frechette passed away before he finished all of the figures in this exhibit. Because Jim was so knowledgeable, held so much traditional knowledge about the Menominee tribe, and because he was such a gifted artist, we don't have anyone who can fill those shoes and finish this exhibit for us. So out of respect, this exhibit will always remain unfinished. Um, but there's a huge amount of information here, not just for Menominee people, but also for non-native people in the state, to give us a greater appreciation of what some of our earliest residents were about. We have an entire website uh, associated with this exhibit that has Menominee origin stories told in both the Menominee language and in English. If you Google Menominee clan story, this exhibit will come up with a host of background information that tells you about the Menominee tribe, their prehistoric homelands in the state, and basically what all of these figures represent and the stories behind them. And again, these figures were donated partially donated to the state of Wisconsin. So again, this is, this is a jewel, this is a resource for the entire state. What we have in front of us here is called a feather box. So inside that box is an eagle feather. And for many native peoples, prior to the use of paper and paper documents, they had legal agreements that were made by word of mouth or with objects such as eagle feathers. So this eagle feather in the feather box represents a legal agreement between the Menominee Nation and the state of Wisconsin, basically talking about the value of this exhibit and it as a gift to the state of Wisconsin. Okay, and and yeah, and, and looking at all the figurines in here, I mean that's I mean by looking at it, there's a lot of detail. I mean, I you'd almost think that something other than a, a person did this, but it's, it's, it's they and look it, so lifelike. They're very lifelike and they're amazingly accurate. So Jim Frechette was not only dedicated and knowledgeable, but he was, uh, he was meticulous in his craft. And what he would do is he would carve a figure and then he would take that figure to other elders in the tribe. And he would say, okay, this is the clan figure I've made, say for the white-tailed deer clan. And the elders would look at it and they would comment on it. They would say, okay, well, that's, those are the right patterns on its vest for the white-tailed deer clan. Those are the right tasks he's doing. But you know what? Maybe that, that little mat that you have there is not the right color or it should be made out of a different material. Jim would not redo a figure. What he would do is he would build a ceremonial fire and he would literally burn up all of that work and start oh, from scratch. So again, this was a guy who was not just creating art, but he felt like he was charged with representing the oral history of his tribe to the world. And that's also another reason the exhibit is here, because Jim felt this was really a way to reach the most people with this knowledge. You'll also notice that we have very little information posted around this exhibit. That's at Jim's request. Typically in a museum you'll see uh, informational tags all over right. the place that explain what you're looking at. In this case, Jim didn't want that because it's a very native approach to learn yourself and kind of 
research things yourself and talk to elders, talk to other people about the meaning of these objects. So Jim really wanted people to access the website and to read about Menominee culture, not to just have it handed to them. I can tell you as a museum director that's it's a, it's a kind of a catch-22. It's a right, little frustrating right. because we want enough information right. to interest people. Um, but again, we respect what the Menominee Nation asked for here. And, and it is under the auspices, under the approval of the Menominee Nation that we have this exhibit here. Right. Now, for being in the state of Wisconsin, we do have a lot of Native American history. Absolutely. Right, even right in Stevens Point. Right in Stevens Point. So Stevens Point is built on the site of a prehistoric Menominee village. That village existed on the Wisconsin River that flows right through the center of downtown Stevens Point. Um, there are indigenous place names, Menominee place names for this whole area. It wasn't just the Menominee that were here prehistorically. The Menominee were here, the Ho-Chunk were here. Um, those were the two main tribes that really have a long, long history, meaning thousands of years in the state. Later, Ojibwa, Chippewa people came in. Much later, we had Oneida people, Stockbridge, Muncie people. So today, we have 11 recognized tribes in the state. Uh, but again, this exhibit focuses mainly on the Menominee Nation. Okay, that is all very, very interesting. Uh, Ray, can you tell us a little bit just about the museum and where people can find the museum? Sure, so the museum is located within the library now called the Albertson Hall in the center of campus. It's the only six-story building on campus, so it's easy to spot. Um, and if you come in either the east entrance or the west entrance to the lobby of the university library, the museum is on the first floor, kind of the south half of the first floor. Very easy to find. Uh, the museum has sort of regular business hours when the museum store and the offices are open. But the museum itself, the exhibits are open anytime the library is open. We have always been free. We, uh, have worked very hard to keep that going. We do not charge admission. This is really a uh, public resource. We serve, uh, depending on any given year, we serve between 100 and 150 school districts in the center part of the state. Um, this is really a community museum. It's not just an academic museum, not just a museum for UWSP students. This is really a museum that's a resource for this whole area and for the state. Mm -hmm. Right. So with that being said, uh, Ray, I thank you so much for oh, having us here. You, there, it's uh, my pleasure. like I said, anywhere I go, I says I'm, I'm always learning a little something new because there's a lot, you know, that anyone can stop out, go to an event, learn something new, and you'll be amazed of what what you'll what you'll find. So well, uh, please I, have people come and check us out. This is this is a great resource mm -hmm. for the area. So like I said, thanks for having us, and until next time. We'll see you on the road.